Welcome to another unit in this Excel course. This time I'm going to talk to you about how I can use Excel and in particular the Excel solver to run a sensitivity analysis with regard to an optimization problem. So here I already prepared a problem. That's the one here. And if I click on Excel solver, which I can find in data and analysis. So here as a final comment, if you do not have this Excel solver at the moment activated or don't know how to use this, please refer to the corresponding tutorial on solving linear optimization problems. There I'm going into detail in describing how we can activate this and how we can use this. So here at this point, I'm simply just using this to click again on solve. And then I get this dialog. And here in this dialog, I can select in the part reports my sensitivity report. And the sensitivity report has two parts. First part with regards to variable cells and the second part with regard to constraints. Particularly if I go back to my problem, I have here the red part and here the blue part. And in the sensitivity report, here the first part with the variable cells this one refers to the red part, the part here with the constraints, this one refers to the blue part. And well, what can we see from this? Well, let's start with the first one with the rival cells. Here I have my decision rivals and I have my coefficients. So those values we already know about. So we have to discuss what reduced costs and allowable increase and decrease means. Well, let's start with the parts here first. So this means by how much I can actually change this coefficient without the solution significantly changing. What do I mean by this? Well, Consider here if I take the 250 and if I just decrease this by 20 or increase this by 30, I'm within these bounds. Whenever I do this, my solution, as we've produced 100 of good 1, 100 of good 2, will not change. So we can just try this out. So here I can just reduce this by 25, so I'm within my bounds. If I then go back to data and the solver, run the problem again, you see the only thing which has changed, but even before, this was here the profit. The solution as such remains the same because I'm still within my predefined boundaries. So if I go back, the allowable increase and decrease more or less give me an interval around my coefficients and tell me how flexible I can react to changes in these coefficients. As this is like the profit I get per piece, I know how vulnerable I am with regard to fluctuations in my profits. In other words, if I have very large values here with the allowable increase and decrease, in particular with regard to the allowable decrease, I know I'm relatively flexible with regard to changes. So I have a very stable production plan. If I have very small values, a very narrow interval, I know I'm relatively vulnerable with my production plan. It's not really flexible, not really stable. So small changes in my profit structure can directly lead to me having to get a new optimal production schedule. Okay, so let's have a look how and what happens if I go beyond these borders. So here I already decreased this coefficient by 25. However, the allowable decrease was at 50. So let's go beyond this. Let's put this at 175. Run the solver again. And you see at this point, 
the solution changes, it no longer makes sense to produce anything of good too. Let's have a look how this impacts here my sensitivity report. I make a new one. And what I see here is at this point my allowable decrease goes to 1 e plus 30 which basically means infinity. So I can decrease this as much as I want because I cannot get below zero. So this means I can do whatever I want. On the other hand, as soon as I increase this by 24 or more, well then I'm again at my threshold of 200, then I will get back to my solution with 100, 100. But if I remain within these borders, I actually stay with this solution. Here I also see something else. If I go back to my first dialog, with the reduced costs I had zero in both situations. Here I have for the one good, which is actually zero, a minus 25. This reduced cost tells me, well, at the moment I'm producing zero units. So what if for some unforeseen reason I decide to still produce a unit of good two? So how much costs will this incur? Because at this moment it's actually the worst of the two goods. So here the minus 25 tells me if I switch one unit from good one to good two, this will result in costs, so in a loss in profit of 25 units. Well, of course, because here I see every good one yields profit of 200, every good two only of 175. That's actually the 25 difference here. So with two variables, it's straightforward. I'm basically moving part from this profit here, or from the, this profit genera generating process here to the less profitable version. So the difference is actually the reduced costs. As I said, this becomes a bit more complicated when I have more variables, but then I can still interpret this as the profit will change by this much if I decide to produce one unit in this good. And well, here I have a maximization problem, so all the reduced costs are negative. If I have minimization problems, usually they are all positive. Okay, so much for the variable cells. Then I have down here my constraints. Again, left side, right side values. This look the same here. Left side values, right side values. And well, I stay with those numbers here. First, I can again talk about allowable increases and decreases. So again, this is more or less how stable am I to changes in my constraints. Here I see, for example, with the second constraint, I can increase this by how much I want. Well, why? Because I already have too much. I already have 500, I need 400. So I'm not using my whole capacity. So my solution will not change in any which way, even if I increase this by how much I like. So this means whenever I have too much, the allowable increase goes to infinity. Okay, and the other part is 100. Well, the 100 also makes sense because the 100 is actually the difference between those two values. As soon as I subtract 100 here, this constraint actually becomes limiting. This becomes a bottleneck factor. So here at this point, I actually have to go and consider changing my production plan. If I go below 400 here. Here in this case, well, I already are 150, uh, 180 above what I have to produce. So here, the third one, 
I have an allowable increase of 180. Only then am I actually breaking even. If I increase this by more than 180, then this is no longer fulfilled, then the solution will change. And similarly for the first one here, I have 50 and 180. But this looks different. Here I'm actually as at equality. So let's take a look what happens. Well, here I have an allowable increase of 50. So let's take a look if I increase this to 220. Let's just run this through here. Well, here the production changes. If I go back to 200. So yeah, the solution changes, the objective function value changes, but the structure, which goods I produce and which goods I don't produce, so which of them are zero and which are not, this remains the same. And that's how to interpret the allowable increase and decrease here as well. If I'm actually at the point where those two values are the same, I have a, a change in solution, but only in so far as the structure remains the same, but I might produce more or less of the one which I still produce. And as I saw, I have a change here in the objective function. So here before I have 40,000. Now I increase this, uh, let's say by 10, make it easier to calculate. Increase this by 10. Then my objective function increases by 2000. Now go back. Look here, we have shadow prices. The shadow price actually tells me if I increase this by one unit. That's actually the benefit I have from this. So here in this case, if I have shadow price which are positive, this means they actually are beneficial for my production. So here, if I increase this by one unit, increases my profits by 200. I increase this by 10 units, so this increased my profits by 2000. So that's also how I can interpret the shadow prices. Shadow prices tell me if I increase the value by one unit, which impact will this have on the profits? Similarly, if I decrease this by one unit, which impact will this have um, on the profits? Then negatively. Here with those ones, I see doesn't matter. So if I'm still within these boundaries, this will not change the profits in any which way. Here, as this is positive, if I'm within the boundaries, the structure remains the same, the solution values might change and profits might change with regard here to the shadow prices. So the shadow prices are also only valid if I stay within these boundaries. I can go back to my original problem because here I saw I have different boundaries as I'm at a different solution and therefore also different shadow prices. At some I have zero shadow prices, here I actually have positive shadow prices but different from the 200 here. And well, that's basically all I can do with the sensitivity report from Excel. So I know what happens if I change the red part. I know what happens if I change the blue part. The yellow and the green parts, they are Excel, uh, they are more or less help tools, helping cells. So I'm not changing anything here at all. So the only thing which remains is the orange part. And that's where I'm going to talk about a bit more in that session on so-called spider plots. With regard to the official sensitivity report, this basically concludes this session. 
And well, I hope you enjoyed it so far. If you want to see additional input on using the solver to solve optimization problems or on Excel in general, feel free to visit the rest of the course or have a look at the corresponding playlist. I say goodbye and see you next time.